All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our February 11th session of the Forage Forum Friday. We are incredibly excited to have you all with us today. Um, I have with me Miranda Edge, um, and we are going to talk to you guys today kind of about four-wheeler farming. Um, so kind of what are some of those tools that especially Miranda and I and all of our friends and colleagues like to use on kind of smaller acreages when we are, when we're working with livestock and forages. So let me go ahead and pull up the presentation here real quick. And we can get started in just a second. Okay. All right. There we go. That way I can still see people. So. All right. Do you want to kind of introduce it, Miranda, and then we'll go from there? Yeah, absolutely. So um, like Alicia said, we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, different equipment implements and tools that we like to use on the farm. And um, my name is Miranda Edge. Go ahead to the next slide. So you can see kind of where our passions lie. I, um, <laughs> I use a little bit of horsepower when I can instead of the mechanical options. Um, but I do raise hair sheep and livestock guardian dogs as well. So um, my uh, expertise is fairly new in the small ruminant section, but I've also worked with cattle and with horses. They are. And and then, like I said, my name is Alicia Rogers. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Educator up in DeKalb County, Indiana, with Purdue Extension. Um, as you can see from our pictures here, goats is kind of where, where my passion is here. Um, married into them almost nine and a half years ago. Um, told my husband at that time that he had a limit of 20 animals on the property for goats. Um, and we are in the process of kidding out 62 does this year. So <laughs> we can see that did not work so well. Um, we also raise a few hair sheep and then I've had some background in, we also raise some, um, dairy calves and some pastured pork, and then a little bit of background in some grazing beef from my parents' operation. So it's a little bit about us. So. Um, kind of our objectives today are kind of just kind of discussing what are some of those items you really need on kind of smaller acreages. What are those things like looking at wheeled machines and implements? So things like tractors, UTVs, ATVs, skid steers. What is it you actually need to get by? And maybe what are some of those handy tools that come with them? Um, we'll look at kind of what our toolbox recommendations are. Maybe what are some of those things that help us out on a daily or weekly or monthly basis when we're working with our animals mm -hmm. or raising forages. And then we'll also take a look at some of the livestock and just kind of barnyard tools as well that we utilize, so. Okay, so um, like this presentation is titled, our four-wheeler farming, and um, this is a big, uh, piece of equipment or rather a small piece of equipment that seems to be very um, useful in different uh, areas, but there can be a little bit of a difference between an actual four-wheeler and other all-terrain vehicles like a side-by-side. -side. Um, I know that we use both of these at some of our small pack farms, um, and I have used both of them in the past just being able to go out and check calves or go out and see what a fence line looks like if I think there's a short somewhere and grab a few tools to fix that fence line um, where it may be needed and then come back. But the side-by-side -side has a little bit more um, capacity. So we're gonna go through a little bit of those differences, but just think about the things that you might need and is it necessary to have both of these vehicles or is one maybe gonna work better for your operation over another? So if you look at the comparison and I just took some middle of the road between um, these four, a four-wheeler type uh, equipment and a side-by-side just those mid grades, not the super heavy duty ones and not the real light duty ones. So something that's a four wheel drive, both uh, all the way through um, to look at what they're carrying capacity. And so, like we said, what I just said earlier with the four wheeler, if I'm going out to check on a mineral feeder or a, um, 
or a fence or something like that, maybe a four wheeler is going to do that for me because I can, I can put a hundred pounds on the front, 200 pounds on the rear in the cargo rack, strap that down. Um, and it's going to turn really easily. It's got a smaller turning radius than the side by side, but, and it's going to cost a little bit less um, than that side by side would. But if I've also got my son with me, that poses a little bit of a problem. Um, he loves to go and help me check things. And so if I'm going to go ride that four wheeler, it may not be as safe for him um, than the side by side. So I'd rather have him seated to where there's a option of a seat belt, seat belt there's a roll rack um, just in case that there were to be something wrong you know I'm in southern Indiana and so if anybody else is in southern Indiana you know we've got hills sinkholes and we grow rocks um, and so any of those at any particular time could upset that vehicle and and cause some a little bit of an accident or even just a bump and throw it out of the seat where if nothing else. And so um, something I think about for myself and also for my son as we're out working. Um, so then the other thing we look at, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about trailers here a little bit later in the presentation is how much I can pull. What's that total weight carrying capacity, not just on the vehicle in the dump bed or on the cargo rack, but actually pulling a trailer. And um, we could pull a little bit with these four wheelers uh, under 1500 pounds. So, you know, if you're going out to fix fence, build fence, you might be able to get all of your equipment on um, on one trailer and be able to pull that no problem. If you're looking to maybe um, pick up and move a set of hogs or move a couple of new mama ewes with their lambs over to a new field to join the rest of the group, it depends on how much you need and how big your, your trailer is as to how much you can actually use with that four wheeler. It may be that that ATV would serve you a better purpose. Um, your weight on the actual vehicle uh, could cause a little bit of a difference in your turf impact. So if you're doing quick checks, so first thing you do in the morning is jump out and go check on calves. Maybe that four wheeler is the better option so that you're not breaking up your turf. Um, you've got a, a lighter weight over your um, field area and so you've got less of that impact on your turf. But if you're going to do some heavier duty one time rolls um, rather than going back and forth, back and forth, that ATV or side-by-side -side would be a better option. Okay, um, next slide. Let's talk a little bit more about options and things that these two could possibly do to help you out on a regular basis. So these pictures come from our Southern Indiana um, pack farm where we are doing some rotational grazing with temporary fencing. Um, that does mean that water minerals um, and fencing materials need to be drug and pulled on a regular basis to new fields, um, adjusting field and fencing materials and things like that as needed. Um, so you can see here, we've got the four wheeler hooked up to the water, side by sides hooked up to the mineral tank. They both have a good option um, to pull with that hitch uh, availability on either one. Some four wheelers may not have that hitch on there. So if you're looking at them and that's a capacity you think it needs to have and serve for you, check to make sure that it does have a um, hitch and receiver so that you can use that to hook onto a basic trailer or something of that nature. Okay, next slide. Some of the tools um, that need to be taken with us uh, may not all fit in a four-wheeler capacity. So we've got that um, cargo tray on the back of a four-wheeler that you can strap down some basic step-in posts. Um, you maybe your, your pliers or a toolbox, something of that nature. But if you're also going out to check mineral, and um, I know when we're out to check the calves mineral, we may be taking um, uh, 200 to 300 pounds of mineral out to put out just depending on how fast they're going through it in the spring um, and, and how hot it is and things like that. And so if I have multiple things that I've got to take, then it may be more uh, beneficial to me to have that side by side that has that big bed in the back and I can kind of store things. Um, you can see here where there is a nice box that's been built to put some of those step in posts to keep them orderly and out of the way so that mineral bags can also be set in there. Um, the other thing you can think about is the capacity to help you move um, your, your livestock when you get to the point where you're 
either following them or driving them somewhere? Does that have the turning radius that helps you to push and drive down a fence line into the next field or even back to the barn if you've got one that's sick and you've got to cut it out of the herd and push it back or grab and throw in the bed of the truck or across your lap on that four wheeler. So those are just some different things that I wanted to bring up and think about um, as you look at the options and the, the availability of those types of uh, vehicles in the field. Other projects and demands that we might find from these all-terrain vehicles is feeding hay in the winter. Um, you'll see this is a roller for the hay so that it can be rolled out and fed across a field um, and also a spreader that can be used in the capacity of fertilizer applications or even seeding in the spring. Um, and so both of those types of um, equipment can probably go on either a four-wheeler or an ATV, but think about you know, some of the capacity of holding extra seed or fertilizer if you need to refill that spreader. Um, if you've got any tools that you need to cut the bale um, or, or work on your, your um, roller in case something happens. So just some different options that you can think of. Those are pretty simple tools that can be used and can help to increase the effectiveness of your feeding and your on your normal jobs on the farm. Go ahead. And I think now we're on the tractors. Yep. Yep. So probably with the round bale roller as well, you have to think about the weight of that bale that you're pulling. So probably the the side by side or the um, UTV would probably be a better option because of that weight that you're pulling. So, all right, maybe there we go. All right. So one thing that people kind of always ask or think about is now I own a farm, so that means I need a tractor. But do you really need that tractor? What size do you need? Will the four wheel or the ATB, like Miranda said, will that work for most of your functions? But if you think you really do need a tractor, there are a few things we need to consider to make when selecting the right size of tractor out there. So we need to think about our tractor's tasks. Is it just gonna be a few small tasks, just moving a little bit larger equipment here and there than what our four wheeler and ATB can handle? Are we going to be loading and moving equipment around that might be a little bit heavier, things like that? Um, think about the tractor's attachments. So do you plan on doing a lot of maybe lane building? So something that will help uh, level the ground. Um, are you going to be moving a lot of things where you might need a bucket that may haul some heavier things? Things like that we think about with the attachments. We need to think about our property. How big is our property? Is it only like for my husband and I, we have seven acres. Do we really need a big farm tractor or would a subcontact work? Things like that. And then again, the amount of weight we need to lift. So are we only maybe um, getting a couple of truckloads of gravel once a year that we need to spread around? Or is it going to be where we're actually going to be using this to maybe clean out the barn or the barn's been cleaned out and we need to load manure into a manure spreader? Um, what are those weight amounts we're really looking at? So those are some things we need to consider. So when we look at tractors, they're kind of divided up into a couple, couple of different ways. But one way that they kind of divide up is into hitch categories. So there are, what are there, three, seven different hitch categories out there, depending on the amount of weight that that hitch can manage. So when we're talking about the hitch, we're talking primarily about the three-point hitch on the back end of the tractor. Um, so a category zero would be like a lawn tractor, be up to a 20 horsepower tractor um, that can basically haul So not very big at all. Um, when we look at something like some of our subcompact sub -compact tractors, we're looking at a category one. So that's going to be a 20 to 50 horsepower tractor with about 2,000 pounds weight capacity. And then you can get up into the category four and, and four. That's where you're looking at the bigger 
true farm tractors that are out in the fields plowing that have a lot of weight that they're carrying dragging pulling things like that they have a maximum weight capacity of up to twenty thousand pounds so a lot of difference so we need to kind of look at our hitch categories what can those hitches hold and what do we need them to pull and things like that so so looking a little bit closer at some of our tractor categories themselves, the first is going to be what we call our subcompact tractors. So maybe just a step up from your normal riding lawnmower, um, but not much bigger than that. So ideally suited, um, kind of just smaller tractors, just really easy to maneuver around and kind of get those sorts of things done. Um, less than 48 inches wide so if you need a narrow space to get through um, that's less than five foot a subcompact tractor could kind of move through that area maybe through some gates things like that um, so some examples would be the Kubota BX series like we can see here um, a John Deere one family um, things like that so our tractors are usually categorized by their engine horsepower um, so a subcompact is going to be about 20 to 25 horsepower is what they typically run at. So a little bit smaller. You can see this one comes with a loader attachment, but it wouldn't be meant to haul a heavy load for a long time. All right, our next category is the compact tractor. So this is generally a little bit larger than our subcompact. You can see here by the picture. Um, so the implements that come with these usually increase productivity um, while still working on that smaller tractor. Usually about 18 horse minimum is what these will be. So about 18 to probably closer to 30 horse is what we would consider a compact tractor. Um, the weight on these is about 1800 pounds. So a little bit heavier, but not too big. Um, and then the tractor width is about 42 to 54 inches. So we're looking at a little less than four foot to almost six foot in width. So that's something to consider as well if we're working through um, lanes, gateways, in and out of barns, things like that. We then have what they term the utility tractor. So this is what are really our mid-sized tractor. Um, so have a, another line of great implements that you can utilize with this. Um, minimum horsepower on the utility is 30 horsepower. So this group would be about that 30 to maybe 40 or 45 horsepower group. Um, a bit heavier, about twice the weight of our compact. So about 3000 pounds. Um, and these guys are gonna be about six to, um, yeah, my math is failing me, about six to eight. Um, in width. So four and a half to eight, six foot in width. There we go. <laughs> Get the math working today. Um, so a little bit larger tractor, but a little handier if you maybe have a few acres. Um, things like if you have um, maybe, let me turn my video off real quick. See if that helps. Okay. So maybe if we have a few acres that we need to mow, um, or if you have maybe a couple of farms that you need to travel between to haul some equipment, a utility tractor might be great to utilize for that. And then we have what we call our large utility tractor. So these are the largest tractors with still that category one three point hitch. So if we remember back to our category one, let's run back to there real quick. So category one, again, was usually 20 to 50 horsepower um, with a maximum weight capacity, capacity of about 2,000 pounds. So about a ton is what these utility tractors can really manage when they're pulling with their hitch. So again, minimum horsepower of about 40 horsepower up to about probably 50 horsepower would be what our large utility would be. Again, larger than our utility, about 4,000 pounds. And these are gonna be about four to five foot. Nope, sorry, 66 to 84 inches. So we're looking at six to seven foot 
in in width. Um, but again, the larger these tractors get, the more they're able to haul, the more they're able to carry for us. And if we're looking at forages, we'll look at that here in a minute, they're able to do quite a bit as well. And then lastly, our true farm tractors. So these are usually designed for that commercial farming. So they're bigger, they're more powerful, they have a lot more features. Um, often they have the multiple hydraulic hookups, PTOs, um, things like that. Um, so a lot more. Usually a true farm tractor is gonna be about 85 horsepower or higher. Um, and then the tractor weight could be a little bit smaller, maybe at 2,500 pounds up to 6,000 pounds or more. Um, and so this is where we get the different hitch categories as well. So they can haul more, they're able to pull more. So this is where we get our category two, threes, and fours on our hitches. Now, when we're talking about tractor implements themselves, there are a few kind of that I find a little more handy that may be able to be more useful around your property. The first is obviously going to be a front end loader. Um, extremely helpful this device. Um, it allows you to connect to a pallet loader. You can put forks on the front of this at times. Um, it's a bucket. Um, there are several other tools that you could use that may connect to those arms up front. Um, so great to use if you are, if you have maybe a dry lot and you're putting sawdust down or something like that for some reason that you have to spread. Um, if you have to spread gravel up and down driveways or dry lot areas, um, a front end loader comes in pretty handy. The second is our mower or cutter or our bush hog, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, so made obviously to cut grass and weeds down to a manageable height. Um, so if we have a lot of acres to trim and a tight schedule in which to do it, this is a great implement to include as well. Um, doesn't have to be very big. They make them from about four and a half foot up to kind of 15 foot or more. So you've got a pretty big selection of your mowers that you can choose from um, that can be helpful. If you have like a lot of ditches that you have to mow, um, or if just your time doesn't work out well where you have a lot of time during the week to mow, you can use something like this to help cut down on that mowing time. Next, we're gonna talk about different types of blades. So we have the box blade and the rear blade. They're very similar, but not quite the same. So a box blade is just a simple design pulled behind the tractor. Um, so the blade itself digs into the ground and then spreads out the material into a flat level layer. So we can see that here, it's like a nice contained box. So it keeps it in a nice area. It doesn't spread out over the sides. Versus the rear blade, it's just the blade that helps to flatten, um, trails the tractor scraping off layer of material depending on how deep you've set that blade but any excess material goes off to the side so you'd have to go back through and work through to the left or right of it to get things evened out but again another great one um, if you're working on driveways um, alleyways different lanes if you're doing some landscaping both are great options some other ones that we found that have come in handy um, for a lot of us that have kind of smaller acres, uh, especially if we're building fence, is the post hole digger. Um, you may think you're big and strong when you get started and you want to dig every hole by hand that you can, just to kind of prove a point, um, get the auger, <laughs> get the tractor implement. It'll save you a lot of sore muscles. It'll save you a lot of time. Um, so it, bores your holes perfectly right where you need them. Again, a word of caution before you dig, make sure you call 811 to check for any underground lines or wires. Um, we had marked some holes when we were building our fence when we moved in, kind of where we wanted them. And then we called 811 in and it's a good thing we did because one of our holes was right on top of one of the wires going underground. 
So make sure you call and get your underground wires, pipes, things like that before you do any digging. So there's your public service announcement for today. <laughs> Um, next thing are pallet forks. So these are great if you have a lot of pallets coming in and out um, with feed or if you have um, maybe square bales of hay on them, things like that. So pallet forks are definitely needed, um, can be on tractors or skid steers that we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, we can also move items to fields or take items out of truck beds, things like that with a little less effort. So if we're putting in a lot of fence posts, having the pallet forks is nice because you can put 10, 12, depending on the weight of your tractor, different fence posts on there, and that can carry your posts to the field for you. Versus my husband and I, when we were putting in our field, um, again, it's just a small little like three acre field, but we decided that we could carry telephone, like 10, put telephone posts by ourselves to each of the corners. I was not happy with him by the end of the day. <laughs> so just some little tools to kind of help us ease some of that maybe spousal <laughs> upset. <laughs> and then the last tractor implement we'll talk about is a spreader. Um, so like we'd seen on the back of the four-wheeler, um, they come in different sizes for different functions. So basically a large hopper that's filled with material to be spread. And then the spinning wheel flings it in an even layer behind the tractor. So it's useful for many applications, like Miranda said, either fertilizing fields, if we're doing broadcast seeding in the spring, things like that. Um, so this is a picture of my dad on their farm. Um, he's just broadcasting probably some clover over their ground in the spring, um, just using one of his old kind of smaller tractors and a used spreader. Does not have to be brand new. If it works, why pay more for it? So now when we're looking at hay production, we've got, to, we also have to consider kind of that horsepower on our tractors as to what different tractors can do different jobs. Now, ideally we'd have just a tractor that could do all the jobs for us. This is great if we're only maybe farming 10, maybe 20 acres of hay. Um, so for my husband and I, this coming year, it looks like we'll probably have anywhere from 90 to 100 acres of hay that we will be making. Um, so on top of everything else, we've got that look ahead to look forward to. Um, so for us, when we're looking at a job like that, we'll actually need probably three, four, maybe five tractors to we have to come back home and unhook one tractor just to hook it back up to the next thing, unhook that to hook it up to the next thing. So for us on kind of a day to day, maybe where we have two or three fields where maybe we're going out to mow in one field. And then the field that we had mowed two days ago is ready to rake. So we need to go out and rake that field next. Or maybe we have another field that's ready to bale. Um, so for us personally, it helps having a few different tractors um, that can kind of switch jobs if need be, but that we can hook to one piece of equipment and that's its job for the summer. We'll have a tractor that will just rake hay or a tractor that will just be on the baler. Um, so just kind of for us, having that dedication for that equipment is nice. But if like us this past year, We've had a tractor that's been in the shop since last June, just because we haven't, our mechanic hasn't had the time and it took him about four months to be able to find all the parts to get that tractor back up and working. So being down a tractor hindered us for a little while last year. And we did have to do a lot more equipment swapping with those tractors to get our hay production done. But this slide just basically shows us kind of what that minimum horsepower is for different parts of our hay production when we're looking at doing different jobs. So when mowing our hay, something like a sickle bar mower doesn't require a lot of horsepower. Um, 15 to 20 horsepower is about all that it requires. Um, something more like a disc mower requires a lot more power just because it has a lot more working parts to it. So you need a little more power behind your tractor. And then tedding and raking hay, 
doesn't require a lot of horsepower, 30 to 40 horsepower will get that job done. And then looking at balers. So looking at smaller acreages, we have obviously the square balers, um, anywhere from 35 to 80 horsepower, depending on the size of the baler and depending on how many bales you're putting out an hour. Um, so for us, we have both kind of your regular offset square baler and then we have an inline square baler that basically lines up right with the center of the tractor. It's a straight shoot straight down. Um, so that inline baler can actually make an 80, 90 pound square bale and not have any issues with rot or moisture, things like that. It just packs that bale a lot tighter. Um, so obviously that needs a little more horsepower because it's packing a lot more hay. I'm not happy when we get those 90 pound bales. Usually I try to have them pack it back down maybe to maybe 75 pounds. Um, but he just wanted to test it starting out to see how heavy of a bale he could actually make. And then on today's market, we actually have mini round balers. So they're kind of a cool little contraption. And so this is kind of what they look like. So they can produce about 40 to 55 pound bales that are round bales. Um, they can be found to attach to a three point hitch, a draw bar. Um, they can be even a walk behind unit. So they can use net wrap or twine and can be easily picked up by a person by hand. Or if you have a small utility tractor with a loader on front, you can go around and put maybe four or five bales in that bucket and carry it back to the barn. Especially if you have some maybe smaller acreages that you're just trying to get maybe a little bit of hay made here and there. Um, I had a thought and I lost it. <laughs> It'll come back to me later, so. Um, so the next kind of mechanized thing we'll talk about are the skid steers. So a few things to consider if you're looking at a skid steer is how large is the space available to operate the equipment. Um, so for us, again, on our farm, we have two different sized skid steers, what we refer to as the Bob Kitten. Um, so it can fit through basically a doorway, which is really nice when scraping our hog barn. Um, so it can fit through a, a three and a half foot doorway, excuse me, four foot doorway. I was corrected, inch. excuse me, 40 inch doorway <laughs> um, without a problem. Um, so it's really handy getting in some of those tighter spaces. Um, but if you have maybe some larger lots you need to scrape, you might want to look at a larger peat, larger get here just to be able to handle that manure a little bit better. Um, so are you going to use the loader in open, unfinished areas that are developed and paved, or are you going to be using it out in the field where it may be a little rocky and muddy, things like that? Um, what type of loads are you going to lift or move? Is it going to be things more like gravel or sand, or is it going to be used for snow or maybe leveling out a riding arena? What's its purpose? And how far lo will loads be hauled? for moving or dumping. Um, so the amount of time that bucket has to be up in the air definitely makes a difference. And then again, what type of work are you gonna be using it for? Is, are you gonna be drilling holes, um, using it to maybe demolish old barns or old sheds, hauling, earthwork, um, what's its purpose? So when we're looking at skid steers, we really have kind of three categories. So we have our small frame, which is going to be about 1,700 pounds, again, under 50 horsepower, um, but it fits in nice small spaces. The issue with a small frame skid steer is if you're trying to unload round bales of hay, um, anything more than about a 750 to 800 pound bale, it gets a bit tipsy. <laughs> um, so something to consider with a small frame skid steer. Medium frame, you're looking at 1750 up to 2200 pounds. So about 50 to 70 horsepower there with that one. And this will actually probably do a lot of the jobs that you need to be get done on most farms. It can handle most bales. Now a very wet bale of some haylage, it might have a little issue with, but for the most part, it should get most of our jobs done that we need. And then we have our large frame skid steers. 
So over 2,200 pounds. So these are going to be much more massive, um, major hauling jobs, things like that, that most of us probably don't need to utilize. So, um, so just this, just kind of an example of a skid steer implement that my parents use on their farm. So this past spring, as my parents were trying to work lambs and ewes and things like that and get them from maybe the barn back out to the pasture if they'd been in for some reason, um, trying to walk them back out to the field wasn't always working. Um, either the ewes were running back to the barn or the lambs were running everywhere. Um, so my dad created what he calls the Uber instead of the Uber. Um, so this just attaches, it's on a pallet that goes on the front of his skid steer um, that he can call haul two or three ewes with and their lambs to get them back out to the pasture a lot easier than trying to physically move those animals. So that's just a kind of a fun example of a skid steer implement that could be utilized. Turn it back over to you, Miranda. Okay, thank you. So um, small implements definitely can help, but another great piece of equipment that we can all use on a farm is of course a pickup truck. And it's uh, a multi-use vehicle that can get you to the grocery store, feed mill, uh, can go through the pasture if needed, transport hay and pull your trailers, something like that. So what kind of a truck do you have? What kind of truck are you needing if you don't have one right now that's, that you believe is adequate? And um, how do you tell? What's, what is important to know when you're looking for the truck that's gonna do the work for you? Next slide, please. So every pickup truck has its own um, usefulness, its own weight rating for towing maybe a trailer or carrying a heavy load in the bed. Um, and you can find that usually pretty easily, but um, there's a couple of different places that you should look. And if nobody's, um, if you know, no one has seen Fred Whitford's, Dr. Fred Whitford's presentation on towing a trailer, I highly recommend catching that at a private applicator program or another producer type field day um, because it's a very, very informative. So to shorten that up and, and give you just kind of the basics of that is double check and make sure that the truck you have is going to pull the trailer that you have or want. So the first place that I always look is right on the inside of the door frame of the chassis and look at what is the gross vehicle weight rating. And so on this particular picture in um, the bottom picture of the white sticker for the Ford truck, it says that its gross weight uh, vehicle weight rating is 7,200 pounds. Now that's probably more like a 150 instead of this larger vehicle, but we'll go with this as a scenario. The second place that you really need to look because, okay, we know now this truck can handle 7,200 pounds, but when you attach that trailer, you are also attaching it to a hitch that is connected to your truck chassis, to your frame, um, and could have a little bit different rating than the actual truck. So it's very important very, very important to get crawl under there and look at the actual hitch and what that rating is for the hitch. And you'll see um, this black sticker that's right underneath the picture of the hitch shows a couple of different numbers and um, there's a weight rating um, and weight carrying. And this one is actually, the circle should be around the 5,000 pounds instead of the 11,000 pounds. So um, we can see that, yes, the truck can handle 7,200 pounds. However, our hitch can only handle 5,000 pounds. Um, and so anything over that is gonna be a little bit of a tax on the hitch, maybe not so much the truck, and you could find yourself in trouble. Um, this particular example happens to be my last truck that I had, and I'm glad I looked underneath and saw that uh, because the total weight of my particular trailer was about 6,400 pounds, um, and I found out real quick that that was just not going to happen, and I had to um, look at a bigger vehicle so that I was not going to get in trouble. 
So um, this is probably the best case scenario if you've got too heavy of a trailer hooked up to your truck is that you're just going to have an off weight. Worst case scenario could could look pretty bad and um, Dr. Woodford gets into a little bit more detail than I was ready to get into today for this particular presentation, but um, this just serves the purpose of very it's very, very important to understand and un know how much your trailer weighs and what your vehicle can tow. So let's look at a couple of different types of trailers out there. Um, the, these are a couple of my particular trailers and Alicia's gonna go through some of her trailers. I'm um, a lot smaller, I'm only on an acre. So I have just a few sheep and a couple of trailers at the moment. Um, so on the right side is my truck. And so it's at a capacity uh, still of 7,200 pounds, but my hitch is at a rating of um, 8,400 pounds. And so my trailer, which is still the 6,400 pound trailer is adequate um, for the capacity of my truck. And so I'm good with that little stock, stock trailer. It fits my needs and I'm gonna safely be able to go down the road to sell lambs, to haul off you know, anything that I would need. I move a lot of hay with this. And so I don't really worry too much about the weight of it um, because I know what the rating is on my actual truck. So on the left side is um, an actual DIY built or, or home built trailer um, on lawn tractor tires. And it was originally used for moving hay, um, but custom built trailers can help you in different circumstances. So I purchased this trailer to use as a shelter for my sheep. I'm doing some rotational grazing and actually renting space on different fields. And so it's very important for me to have something that is a mobile shelter. I'm also working on building this into a little bit more of a permanent structure. Um, and have the ability to collect rainwater um, and hold a larger capacity of water on there. Mineral um, and even possibly a creep feeder at some point. And so the length of this trailer worked well for me. My sheep learned really, really quickly to jump up in there. They have no problems with it. And so for right now, this is working really well for my purpose. Um, again, weight of the trailer is probably empty 800 pounds to 1,000 pounds. Um, adding that structure as it is right now, put very, very little weight on it. So I don't have any problems pulling it at the moment. Um, I'm going to put a little bit more of a structure with, with a frame, a wooden frame and a um, slanted roof so I can do some more collection. So it's going to put a little bit of weight on it. But um, again, I know what that weight capacity is and I know what I'm able to pull with this. And so I'm kind of excited to see what um, I can build and how this might be able to uh, help me make it a little easier to do some rotations with my sheep. All right, That's Alicia, go an through thing to note. your stuff. <laughs> probably an important thing to note there on Miranda on the trailer that you're working on there is that you've put the weight towards the front of the trailer. Um, so that kind of balances. If you put the weight more towards the back of the trailer, I'm sure you guys have seen the different commercials and things like that, where traveling down the road, that trailer just starts wobbling back and forth uncontrollably. Um, so making sure when you're loading trailers that you have that good balance towards the front of the trailer with that absolutely. weight. Absolutely, yep, absolutely. And so, right, putting um, water barrels on this or a tank of some sort, that's gonna go more towards the front for that added weight. And um, that shelter piece probably won't push back too much more because of putting that weight more towards on the tongue. Very good, thank you. Yep. All right, so on our farm, um, up until this past, well, May, um, we were utilizing a 16 foot livestock bumper trailer um, on our farm. But for us going to goat shows and things like that with the number of animals we were starting to take in things, um, 16 foot trailer for us was just starting to get a little bit too cramped. Um, so this past year we were able to purchase a 24 foot Barrett, um, that actually has two cut gates in it. Um, it's got one immobile and then one that moves about front and forth or front to back. Um, so we can kind of adjust that second cut area. Um, so for us on our farm, this size of trailer is more what fits our needs than what the bumper pull was. The bumper pull worked, 
but it just wasn't as functional for us as what this one is. Um, for us, we also found that people were more likely to ask to borrow our bumper, bumper pull a lot more just because they seemed to think that it was a lot easier to maneuver with their little bit lighter trailers or a little bit lighter trucks. Um, so with this trailer, it's, yeah, you're not going to be able to borrow it quite as easily. Um, so for us as well, if we only have a few animals we need to move, um, we've kind of gone in and purchased a popper together with another friend of ours um, that we can just throw in the back of our truck. Um, so for example, this popper, nope, it was another popper. Um, we had borrowed another popper from a friend of ours last January to go up to Northern Michigan to pick up a like eight month old buck. Um, it didn't require us to haul the trailer in the snowstorm we'd gotten the night before. We were just able to throw it in the back of the truck and we didn't have to worry about that extra weight on the back of the truck with the trailer moving through kind of the slushy stuff. So these are kind of the two units that we utilize to kind of help us move livestock for our farm. Um, some of our other trailers that we have <laughs> is the 16 foot just flatbed trailer. Um, so this gets utilized quite a bit. Um, last thing it got hauled was some uh, hog panels that we were able to purchase for a fairly reasonable price. Um, so that's kind of still what's sitting on there. Um, and then our little kind of it used to be a manure spreader used to be a manure spreader there we go um kind of maneuver down to just a little wood cutting wagon um is what we see kind of down here in the bottom right picture um so a really handy little kind of utility trailer if we're just going out to the woods to cut maybe a small load of firewood um or maybe we just have to haul a couple bales of hay um, so this little little trailer has worked really well for us. And then we have our fencing trailer. So you'll have to kind of excuse the mess of the coop the shed behind it. But this fencing trailer comes in really handy for us. Um, so when we moved in, we didn't really have much of a fencing situation put up on our property. Um, so did you make this trailer? Mm -hmm. Yes. So my husband made this trailer. Um, and so he's great handy with a welder, um, didn't take much time at all. And so we've got kind of our two levels on this trailer. So the lower level, we have our spinning wheel. You can kind of see it here on the right hand picture with the wire on it. Um, and then on the top, we have kind of our rolls of fence, our step in posts and things like that. So when we were actually out building fence, we could haul this behind our four wheeler without a problem. Um, it was light enough, but all the tools that we could think of that we might need besides the larger fence post, we could haul on this fencing trailer. Um, so it's worked really well for our property. And then other wagons that we utilize, um, we've got several different styles of hay wagons um, that we use that you can kind of see here. Um, obviously some of the hay wagons get utilized for firewood during the winter. Um, so we heat exclusively with firewood or fire, uh, no, with wood, there we go. <laughs> um, so we cut a lot of wood during the winter. Um, so for us, we use primarily wood racks. We have, I think, one wagon that's a metal rack that none of us love to bale hay on. So it's kind of the last one that gets utilized. Um, but it's good for, for hauling the firewood that you can see here because it does have that front little step on it. Um, so for us, we do, for the most part, build our own decks on our hay wagons. Um, so this past summer, we had a hay wagon that was well past its prime. Um, by the time the third person stepped through the floor, my husband then decided, okay, maybe it's time to rebuild it. Um, I happened to be the first person to step through that floor and was not happy with him that day. So in basically about three hours and one afternoon, we are able to completely take the deck off and rebuild it. So it doesn't take much time as long as you know kind of what you're building and have the supplies there and ready. Um, so probably the floor on a hay wagon, um, we re rebuild those probably about every 10 to 15 years. Um, the back rack doesn't get quite as much work. So those are probably 20 years or more on the back rack.
So those are just kind of some of the wagons that we use. So Miranda. Okay, so we um, went through a couple of homesteader websites and talked to some friends to build this list um, and, and as well as ourselves. So looking at things that I always have in my toolbox, always have on me when I'm going to fix fence, um, we came up with some pretty necessary things. If I'm ever without a pocket knife, I feel like I'm done, I need to stop and just go back, try again. Um, it's basically my number one piece of um, equipment that I, I feel like I have to have with me at all times. The other one that I've learned very recently how to use, and I have kind of small hands, um, so it took me a little bit to get the feeling of it was the fence pliers because they are so compatible to help you with different pieces and parts of the fence. Um, that has now become my new favorite tool to have on hand at all times. Um, voltage testers, I have, I'm running a lot of temporary fencing and um, law, tall grass and things like that. And so I'm kind of always testing my fence to make sure I've got a good charge all the way around with hair sheep. If anybody else has got them, you know, they're going to roll right through it, especially this time of year when they're nice and fuzzy, um, unless it's really, really hot and they hit it real quick with their nose. And so um, I'm doing that. Stepping posts, adding in extra posts, even on, I've got a really nice Gallagher fence reel that already has the posts on the strands of wire, but I add extra ones in just to make sure it's got a good tension and, and barrier for those sheep. Um, when I'm looking at my exterior fences, I've got woven wire in some of the um, places that I'm renting and grazing. I make sure I have some extra wire in case I need to fill in a hole that a lamb could fit through insulators to make sure, you know, there's nothing hitting um, wood or, or a piece of the woven wire where it needs to be a charged fence. Um, and then some other tools as you're fixing things, um, you know, if a fence pops off um, or, or a gate pops off of the hinge or you're um, fixing a water line or something of that nature, vice grips, adjustable wrenches, things like that. Hammers can do a lot of good or a lot of damage, depending on how mad you are that day, of course. Um, a hand drill or um, a battery operated drill is helpful with a set of, of bits and different sizes and um, a Torx and a fill. Um, was helping at that point in time as to what type of screw I might find in my um, in the wall holding that up. And so having some different size bits and types of bits really helps um, reduce the amount of time it takes me to do some moving around of different things. Being on a smaller area, I don't have electricity everywhere. And so a flashlight and especially a headlamp version of a flashlight really, really, really helps. Um, my son tends to steal these, so I have several of them in different areas just in case I go to find the one that I'm looking for. He's taking it, he's using it for something else. Um, I can go and grab maybe another one out of my truck or it's in, you know, another tack box somewhere in, a, in the barn. Ratchet straps, um, if you've got something that looks like it's going to fall off, you're trying to stack your hay so you only have to make one round, that ratchet strap can really help, you know, make sure everything stays intact. Chains, in case you get stuck, somebody else gets stuck. Um, needle nose pliers, again, small hands, those needle nose pliers sometimes make a world of difference in catching little things. Um, they tend to hold... Hand, I can handle them a little easier than some of the other um, pliers out there. And, and so twisting wire and um, tightening things, that's re really helpful. Um, a post hole digger. So if you want, um, if you want to dig your own holes or if you've got one post you've got to reset or something like that, those are helpful um, to have so that you don't have to pay, take the big uh, implements out, hook it up to the tractor, set it up, drive the tractor out there, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it just kind of depends on how much work you're doing. Of course, when you're doing a full fence line, this, this is not going to be the, the piece of equipment that you're going to want. Um, but for that one 
posts that you just need to reset because it's it's become loose. That that's kind of where that comes from. Um, along the same line is a post driver. So if you're using T posts, a post driver would help if you've got a loose T post or you need to add another one in. Um, your fencing wire on a reel, like Alicia's got that on her trailer, um, or you can sit that in the back of your truck. Um, in the bottom right, right, bottom left corner picture, you can see that reel of wire and also some bailing wire. Sometimes that stuff can come in handy, and I know we all have a little bit of that around. Um, anything else that people can think of, we'll ask at the end, kind of another uh, chance to throw those out there in the chat box. but. If there's anything else that you find is a kind of a necessary tool in your toolbox and you want to throw that out there to share, um, we welcome anybody else's suggestions on that. So when it comes to specifically on livestock and things that I'm always carrying around or always have available just in case, um, I most of the time have a bag of mineral handy, easy to grab and um, either on the back of the ATV or I'm, I've got it in the barn ready to go to throw on um, knowing they're going to go through that mineral um, at different rates at different times of the year. I like to have a halter or some sort of a rope with me um, so when I go check. If I've got a ewe that is having a hard time lambing, um, something looks sick, needs foot trimmed or, you know, at least checked, something like that. Having a, a access to something that I can catch and hold that animal so that I have a chance to diagnose any issues, um, find something, you know, be able to hold it and, and manipulate it so that I can get, get it some help that it needs. Um, tags and taggers, if I've got something that's lost a tag, um, a new lamb that's come overnight or something like that, if I've got those available, I can go ahead and tag it, um, knowing that day one is about the easiest day to grab a lamb and match it up with its mama. About day three, they're going to be jumping around too much and um, playing and socializing that sometimes it's hard to figure out which lamb goes with which with you. I also like to use paint sticks for the same reason. I can tag um, or mark rather ewes and lambs to pair them up um, or just to mark to say, hey, there's something that I need to come back and check on this one. So I use a paint stick because it's real easy to go through and just mark the back um, and it's easy to find them when they're all bunched together. Um, and that way I can sort it out and work on it. Again, also uh, hoof trimmers. So if I have something that looks like maybe it's got a little bit of a hoof issue, a long toe or something that maybe I've missed during my regular trimming, I can go out there and grab that lamb and or you and, and trim their hooves and make sure that um, that they're going to be okay and not get a hoof rot, you know, later on down the road. This time of year, I'm I'm lambing. Um, Alicia's kidding. She's got several of them on the ground. I know there's several out there that are starting calving or almost done with calving even. Um, so the things that I would also have in my toolbox or, or real handy at, at this time would be a Nutrigen a drench gun. For my lambs, I always give new lambs a couple of cc's of selenium. So BOCE is my um, selenium that I give them. I like to have a scale and I've got a setup where I can hang. I've got basically a, a big shepherd's hook that I can hang my scale onto off the back of my ATV or my truck. And um, so if I'm out in the field, I can just grab them with a um, hanger and sit them on that scale, see how much they weigh. And that gives me an idea um, later on if they're growing well or if I've got an issue. Um, and then I always like to do an iodine dip or a spray. I, I do all of my lambing out in the field. I don't put them in a barn. So that um, really helps me to have all of the things I know um, to do to help them to survive and th thriving out in the field. All right. And then the other thing you need to think about is the actual toolbox itself. Um, so this is an incredibly handy tool, not just for tools. Um, not just for going fishing and things like that. Um, so this is our setup right now. Like Miranda said, we are we're actually two thirds of the way through kidding. Um, so that's been just a two week process. We're 44 does down. We've got 20, no, 18 left to go um, as of chores this morning. So 
we're on the downward trend. But for us, we have a toolbox full of our syringes, needles, um, kind of those harder things like that. And then we have our um, medicines and things that are either in the fridge or in the house in kind of a cooler place so they don't freeze out in the barn. Um, so they're ready to go and handy when we need them. So for us, an actual toolbox is incredibly handy. Um, for my parents, when they're lambing out on pasture themselves, um, they'll take an old mineral tub and have the toolbox just right out in the pasture, kind of outside of the gate, put the old mineral tub over the top of the toolbox so it's protected. Um, so that way my dad doesn't forget it every time he goes out to the field to check. Um, he's got his mineral tub there so he can grab his lambs and throws them in the tub. Um, he can tag them, give them their shots, write down what they need, and everything's right there for him. So that's what he utilizes it for. Um, and then for me personally, this is probably one of my handiest tools that I have around my farm. Um, so this was a sled that my dad made for us here a couple of years ago. Um, he basically took a 55 gallon drum and that's the bait of this sled and then built a wood frame up around it. And it is incredibly handy for us um, going through mud, through snow, over frozen mud, um, through grass, things like that. Um, going out to a couple of our shelters, we will take like three or four bales of straw to go bed, um, or if we have to haul hay, or if we have a downed goat somewhere, um, this sled comes really handy, especially versus like a wheeled cart that may be a little bit less handy to move over some of those harder bumps. So for on our farm, this is definitely a handy tool. So. With that, kind of our last question, if you'd like to answer, what are some of your favorite tools? Um, I know we had quite a few questions and things in the chat box, so let me stop share and we'll open that up. And let me launch a poll real quick, if you guys would mind Ooh, sharing that. Okay, yes. I've been trying to keep up with the chat questions. Okay. Um, I think a lot of them are, are some comments. Keith kind of posed a question about smaller acreage, um, custom operations, people out there that would help with custom operations. Um, and so it mm -hmm. did spark some good conversations. So I appreciate that. Yes. Um, so if anybody's near those counties where there are producers, um, feel free to, we can ask, try to ask some more questions to get, get some information about that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that kind of brings up another point. Um, if you need to go out and maybe drill a field or do something like that, um, a lot, several soil and water conservation districts across the state um, may have a drill you could utilize, especially if you're doing some no-till drilling. So you may not have to go out and purchase a drill yourself. Um, you just have to check to make sure you have a tractor that would be enough horsepower to haul it. Um, but if it's something that maybe you're just renovating a pasture or you're just putting a new maybe top dressing in, um, that'd be something to really kind of consider instead of having to go buy a whole unit itself. Um, yep. yep, we've got a drill, a um, disc, or a couple of different size discs, I believe, and a um, aerator available at our soil and water office. Mm -hmm. So yep. you might check and see what's available because there's there's some uh, equipment out there that you can rent. Mm -hmm. Yep. And there may be a, a small dealer. I know we've got, a, um, what is Harmony? Yeah, we've got a couple of we've John. A small John Deere dealer yep. and a small uh, Massey. Yeah, John Deere and a small Massey dealer that they have some rental as well. Um, so if it's something that you're only doing a couple of small jobs with, renting is definitely a good option, so. All right. Well, we don't have any more questions. We thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, thank you, Miranda, for helping helping with this. It was a lot of fun, and we hope you guys have a great week. Um, Appreciate that, and thank you for filling out the poll for us. That really helps us as we move forward in our um, Forum Fridays. These this is our second season, so having this feedback has really helped us um, to make sure that we're continuing to answer the questions that you're asking. Mm -hmm. And again, just a reminder, if you're interested, the Indiana Forage Council annual meeting 
is coming up on February 24th. They're at SureTech Labs in Indianapolis. Um, so you can visit the Indiana Forage Council website for more information or reach out to myself or Miranda or Dr. Johnson um, for more information on that. It's going to be a great evening, um, a lot of good networking. Um, so we'd love to see you there. So, yep. Thank you very much. All right. If there are no other questions, we thank you all and have a great weekend. We look forward to seeing you next week for our next session.